you know, space technologies, of course, can serve and serves humanity in very many different ways. And one very specific way is the detection and prevention of specific crime. So the use for law enforcement. And this GNF session of today is organized by KSAT, and it is titled Illegal, Unreported and Unregulated, so in short, IUU phishing, and uh, the use of space technology to address organized crime in the global fishing industry. And during this panel, the speakers will discuss how one can use space technology to monitor and safeguard global oceans to facilitate a fair and sustainable use of our oceans. And allow me to welcome on stage our moderator of this session, Mr. Martin Sketsmo, Key Account Manager, Earth Observation Sales at KSAT. Please, the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, all, and welcome to this panel called IOU Fishing, using space technology to address organized crime in the global fishing industry. Today, we are going to shed some more light on the challenges with organized crime in the fishing industry and how space technology is being used and can be further used to even out the odds. But first, I would like to introduce the panelists uh, to the scene. We are lucky to have Gunnar Störsvik from Blue Justice with us today. Come on. Thank you. Gunnar is a specialist director at the Norwegian Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries with a special responsibility to follow up the Blue Justice Initiative, which we will hear more about during this panel. The next speaker is uh, Nina Voya from uh, Barents Watch. <clears throat> Nina has led Barents Watch since August 2021. Barents Watch is located in, uh, in Tromsø and is a national interagency initiative organized within the coastal administration of Norway. Barents Watch collects, develops, and shares information about Norwegian coastal and marine areas. And the third speaker to the panel is Marte Indegard. She is the CCO of KSAT. <clears throat> Marte has more than 25 years of experience within the satellite industry, and she has been with KSAT since 2002, where she had had a really important role of building up the Maritime Services at KSAT. So, a big hand to all the panelists. <clears throat> Thank you. And now the original plan was also <clears throat> to have Dr. Gavin Bellamy, he's the CEO of the National Fisheries Authority at Jamaica, at the panel as well. Uh, but unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here with us today. Nevertheless, he has made us a pre-recorded video that we will show in a short while. But first, I think we would like to start this panel with a video from the Blue Justice Initiative that sheds some more light on IOU fishing. It is the Norwegian contribution to address the challenges of organized crime in the global fishing industry. Through Blue Justice, Norway supports a number of activities to assist primarily developing countries to follow up the minister's declaration on the same topic that was adopted in 2018. Because it creates and sustains poverty. It undermines the sustainable management of resources that belong to all of us. We depend on the ocean for food, jobs, energy and all the other things we need to fulfill the sustainable development goals. And fisheries crime harms the ocean and it harms the fight against poverty. Fisheries crime is a complex problem, which includes illegal fishing, economic crime, slave labor, corruption, money laundering and a number of other crimes. We need politicians, such as ourselves, to speak up 
and recognize the existence of this complex problem. I think this recognition prepares us to work together to solve this global problem. These criminal networks are very well organized. We need close cooperation, we need to share knowledge, and we need stronger action to fight this. We must work smarter across sectors, across government agencies, and across borders. And we must use smart digital solutions to fight organized crime in the fisheries. Let's work together towards a sustainable and fair blue economy. Free from fisheries crime. Excellent, and I guess that kind of sets the scene for this panel. But to start the panel <clears throat> further on, I would like to also show the video from Dr. Gavin Bellamy from Jamaica to give us some more insights on their struggles. I'm Gavin Bellamy, the CEO of the National Fisheries Authority, Jamaica. It is widely recognized within the international fisheries management arena that illegal, unreported and unregulated IUU fishing depletes fish stocks, destroys marine habitats, distorts competition, puts honest fishers at an unfair disadvantage and weakens coastal communities, particularly in small island developing countries such as those in the Caribbean. Estimates of the total size of the IUU catch and its impact on the environment varies widely. However, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, reported that some important fishing areas, the Caribbean being one, IUU fishing accounts for up to 30% of total catches, and for some species, IUU catches could be up to three times the permitted amount. With this having a monetary value between 450 and 750 million US dollars for the region. The two year closure of the Jamaican Kong season caused the country to lose approximately US $6 million per year in direct earnings. And the unemployment of over 5,500 citizens, which was a direct effect of poaching. In the case of Jamaica, we have estimated that a single poaching vessel can cost the country up to US 700,000 per trip. These poachers with up to 100 men and children aboard often target high valued and prohibited species including lobster, conch, sea cucumber, turtles, sharks, and at the same time violate a number of local and international laws including human trafficking, financial fraud, illicit drug and gun trade. Jamaica has an area of 11, approximately 11,000 kilometers square and an EZ of 274,000 kilometers square, which is approximately 25 times our landmass and as one of the largest fishing banks in the region, which is over 8,000 kilometers square, which is located 80 kilometers south of the island at its nearest point. The responsibility to monitor and secure such a large area is mainly that of the Jamaica Defense Force Coast Guard, which is, a, which is an organization with many roles, inclusive of maritime safety, search and rescue operations, pleasure craft inspection, response to oil and hazardous substance spills, immigrations, customs, drug and guns interdiction, and fishery crimes enforcement. With the multiplicity of roles, the country's ability to monitor our EZ and fisheries resources is limited as the JDF Coast Guard currently only has four offshore patrol vessels. 
the cost of marine patrols is invariably high and the effectiveness for the Coast Guard to patrol such a large area is very low. However, if we had the assistance and the access to usable real-time satellite information to inform targeted enforcement activities, the effectiveness will be increased, not as what now obtains with the current situation of incidental findings and acting on days old human information. Also, an option of having a dedicated vessel to monitor the fisheries water would exponentially increase the effectiveness and the use of this information. Coordination of local and regional legislations among member states across the region, particularly for transboundary or highly migratory species, such as lobsters and large pelagics, requires harmonization of certain legislative measures and a unified enforcement effort. The information, the, this informed the establishment of the multi-agency mechanism in Jamaica to foster greater interagency cooperation and collaboration in combating organized fisheries crime both locally and across borders. In addition, a regional response, the Blue Justice Caribbean Hub, was launched with the assistance of the Blue Justice Initiative out of Norway to coordinate a collaborative regional approach to combat transnational organized crime in the fisheries sector using digital tools and analytics. Poachers often use innovative methods to elude law enforcement. These include the non-broadcasting of AI signals and other detection mechanisms. Even while the said poachers remain compliant in their own lands, waters uh, to their local laws. I must at this time confess that none of the Jamaican fishing vessels have AIS. These so-called dark vessels are therefore difficult to identify using conventional means, the use of satellite-based and artificial intelligence mapping tools to predict and monitor their movements within the EEZ of states is critical and will allow for greater success in protecting our marine space and ultimately sustainability of our marine resources. There is no simple single or short-term solution to IUU fishing and the related organized crime associated with within the fisheries sector. Successful responses will require holistic and integrated policies linked to drivers for IUU fishing and effective law enforcement efforts. This is where the partnership and use of advanced technologies, especially satellite information, to inform targeted responses to eliminate and deter IUU and organized fisheries crimes becomes essential. Okay, uh, thanks to Gavin for this very important message from Jamaica. And <clears throat> as we now heard like first hand how serious the consequences of IUU can be and some of the urgent requirements that those fighting illegal fishing require. Let us now look at possible solutions. And uh, I would like to begin with you, Gunnar, from the Blue Justice. Could you please tell us a bit about the Blue Justice uh, initiative? Yes. Um, <clears throat> first of all, is, is the microphone on? Yeah, yeah. OK. So uh, thank you very much. And thank you so much for, for inviting me to, to speak at this very interesting event I've had. Um, uh, has been very interesting to 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 see and also to to visit the space community. So I, I hope to to be able to do that more often after this. So um, uh, well, my name is Gunnar Stolzi. I work in the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Fisheries in Norway, and. Um, uh, my uh, main responsibility is is the Blue Justice Initiative. So um, to 
you already have seen the, the, the video of the two ministers that are sort of the political um, backdrop of, uh, of the initiative here in Norway. Uh, but on, uh, on this uh, slide here, uh, the opening page, um, you see uh, a lot of countries with, uh, with these red uh, zones around, that's the EEZs, the Exclusive Economic Zones of, uh, of Countries. And these are primarily the countries that are supporting um, this political basis for, uh, for the Blue Justice Initiative, which is what we call the Copenhagen <coughs> Declaration. As you can see, it's, it's the Global South that is, is particularly focused on this. And that is also the reason why the main objective of the Blue Justice Initiative is to support uh, particularly um, uh, countries in, in the Global South um, against uh, fisheries crime uh, and to, to address the challenges in this declaration. So I, I can talk more about that, but I think I leave it with that. Uh, it's 60 countries that are supporting it. Um, it's, uh, it's an agreement on, uh, on what the problem is. And, uh, and in, my, in our view, it's very important to have a shared understanding of the problem to be able to solve it. And of course, satellite uh, and space technology is absolutely crucial to, in, this, uh, in this fight. So I, I think I leave it uh, with that. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Gunnar. Uh, <clears throat> clearly that the Blue Justice is an important initiative and um, can have a real impact as a change agent towards IOU fishing. Uh, it's also interesting <coughs> to hear about all of your member states as there's quite many of them. Uh, it also gives us a picture of uh, how needed such a tool would be. Uh, let us now turn to Nina and uh, learn a bit more about Barents Watch and what do you do in your organization. Yes, thank you. I am going to tell you a little bit about the Norwegian model of how, Nor how government agencies work together through Barnes Watch, and how we think we have a tool that can help address the problem of illegal fishing that we heard about from Jamaica. Uh, illegal fishing is a crime, and it is a government responsibility to combat uh, crimes using the law enforcement monopoly that states have. And for all coastal states, it's a challenge uh, to control the ocean areas. You cannot be at all places at all times, so you need to use technology and you need to use it in a smart way to monitor your areas and to exercise law enforcement effectively. In Norway, we have ocean areas that are uh, six times larger than our land territory. And already 10 to 15 years ago, uh, there was a recognition that Norway needed a tool for better ocean monitoring and for securing interagency communication and cooperation, and importantly also to ensure a joint situation awareness to all the agencies that operate at sea. So Norway established Barents Watch, which is a government-led cooperation model among around 30 different agencies. And through Barents Watch, a tool is provided. It is both a technical platform, but I would argue more importantly, it's also a model, a new way of, uh, a method of working. How so? Let me explain. Barents Watch consists of two parts. One part is open and public, and it provides digital tools with open data for fishermen, for fish farming, spatial planning, and a lot of other purposes. The other part is for government internal use among eight agencies. And the idea is to gather all the relevant data, all the sensors, and all the sources that you can find in one place and to show them in a digital service in a context that is relevant for the user. And obviously, the more sensors, the more data you have access to, the better is your total understanding of the situation. 
at least potentially if you have a good system to show you all this data. In other words, the technology to process and show the data is one important and necessary part of the equation, but it's not sufficient. The technology alone is not enough. You also need the interagency cooperation. Because as we heard and saw on the video, the criminals, they are well coordinated and the authorities have to be well coordinated too. And you need to understand that the data or information that you have as one agency is, could be important also for other agencies. And when you start sharing data, you can achieve larger things. The second thing you need to do is to engage the actual people on the operational level, the people who are out there working for the government, the fishing inspectors, the coast guard operators, the police personnel, those who have their boots on, so to speak, and they know what is needed to do their job. And so based on the success that Barnes Watch has been in Norway, we have been very fortunate to have been asked by the Norwegian Ministry of Oceans and Fisheries to develop, provide and run the platform for the international fight against organized crime at sea, the, the Blue Justice uh, Initiative. And we are working together with um, Gunnar and his colleagues to provide this platform and to improve and develop it and to make it the best possible tool with the best available data, be it data from AIS, ship detection, satellite data, radar data, data from public registries, put it all together to increase the oversight and the coordination among uh, agencies inside the country, but also regionally and internationally, because the crime is global and we need to, f we need to have global solutions if we are to fix it, or at least contribute to it, and that's what we're hoping to do in Balance Watch. Excellent, thanks. So, hearing from you on your organization and all the member states, and then Nina, with uh, how her model is set up, the platform, and also the method of working together, mm. I guess that what you need more of is probably more sensors mm -hmm. and stuff to be able to monitor. So, then I will leave the word to you, Marta, to tell a bit more about KSET. Thank you, Martin. Um, first, two words about uh, KSAT. So we are a true service provider. We provide uh, ground station services to satellite owners, both agency and uh, commercial uh, sector. And they are, you know, many of them are here, maybe not in the room today, but uh, in, in the conference now. And then we use the data, some of the data from these satellites, into our uh, advanced moni maritime monitoring services, which is the topic um, of today. We are a new region company headquartered in Tromsø, and uh, on the screen now you see the world largest ground station in, in the world, up in Svalbard. And then we have 27 ground stations around the world with 270s antenna. And these ground stations are located all around, and they are an excellent w uh, in an excellent way in order to access the data very quickly. So we can access the data, and then we can provide information to end user quickly. And when you want to monitor the ocean, of course, this is crucial because uh, it, you know information gets old very quickly. So you need to access the information fast. In Norway, uh, we have actually used these tools since the 90s. Those of you who have been in the business for very long, you know already ERS was uh, operational in, in the 90s. And Norway used these tools to monitor the Barents Sea already then. And the Norwegian uh, Coast Guard used the information from these satellites to, to, to look into uh, areas where they knew it could be illegal activities. And then, based on what they saw, what, what we reported in these satellite images, they could change. Should we go out there with an aircraft, or should we you know, go with a petrol vessels? And this way of monitoring the ocean is you know, proven to be the most cost-efficient way to monitor the ocean, putting these tools together. Then satellite-based AIS was invented. And then you had the picture. You could see all the vessels reported with AIS. So that was, uh, was you know, a big, uh, big step uh, forward. 
But like Dr. Gavin told us on, uh, from Jamaica today, that's not enough, because then you only see the, the vessel who have reported with AIS. You also want to find the vessel that has not reported their position. So this might look like a very messy picture, but you know, this is a picture over a few days over Brazil uh, area. And the point with this picture is that the green arrows that you see there, they are vessels reported with AIS. We know who they are, uh, and then the red or orange and targets there, they are what also Dr. Gavin uh, referred to as the black, uh, the dark targets, those we don't have information about, and they are the one maybe which are more interested than we want to investigate further. And this information is already integrated in Barents Watch and in use by the Norwegian government uh, users uh, in, in a safely uh, matter. But we believe, and I think we all share that the view here in, in this panel, that we believe that this information can also be used by other countries, uh, in particular development countries, so we can share the, the Norwegian uh, tools um, outside of, of Norway. Yeah. Since Norway started to use this technology in the 90s, it's only two satellites. But as I think many of you know, it's been a revolution in the satellite business. There is a lot more satellites, uh, higher resolution, uh, luckily more frequent satellites available. So KSAT today is using a lot of, you know, all the commercial satellites with a lot of different owners from different nations in our maritime services today. At least all of those which is applicable for maritime surveillance. And now Norway has also started to invest into different national satellite programs. And since we are in Oslo, I thought it was applicable to, to show you the Norwegian uh, program quickly. So AIS data has also already been used routinely since 2010. Then NORSA 3 came with the RF detector. And that one detects signals from ship radar. And that's a very interesting sensor because, you know, very few ships will turn their radar off and then you will be able to detect and recognize those through distinct radar signals. So it's a, very, it, it's a source that will be used more and more in the, in the future also for dark target detection. Then Kongsberg Defense and Aerospace has invested in a satellite program where they will launch three RF satellites uh, very soon. Uh, Space Norway have a satellite uh, program called Microsar, and this one will include an active radar, like a, a synthetic aperture radar payload, and also an ALS, and will be launched in 25. And then finally, and maybe we'll hear more about that during this conference, the Norwegian Space Agency, Agency recently launched a new program which will include um, an Arctic Ocean surveillance constellation. Um, all these satellites are uh, specifically made for maritime surveillance and will improve the domain awareness pictures in the very near future. KSAT will operate a majority of these satellites and we will, of course, integrate those into the maritime service. So finally, uh, I would like to say that, you know, access to, uh, you can go to the next, access to sensors are important. You know, there are many of them, they are more frequent, they are more, better resolution. But in order to make use of these sensors, you need to put all the sensors together in an intelligent way, and you need to get extract information that is useful for the end users, otherwise, you know, these sen sensors doesn't make sense. And to do this, artificial intelligence is, of course, is really important. Case that use uh, AI or machine learning to detect, both to detect targets, to get more information out of the targets, to track the information, and to fuse this information uh, together. And to do this, we collab collaborate with uh, other industry partners, research institutes. And I think what the revolution we will see in the next few years is how to get more information out of all these sensors and fuse them together. Okay, thank you, Marta. So clearly, just to sum up the introduction here is that we have the Blue Justice Initiative, we have Biden's Watch with their amazing tools, and then we have all these assets in the sky that could be implemented into such a monitoring tool for fighting illegal fishing. 
Uh, I will now turn to the, to the questions for the panelists. Uh, I will do some questions to all of you, and uh, we'll try to find some time in the end for questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please use this uh, slider tool, and I will have it on the iPad here. So, good night. I would like to start with you. What is the main challenges of organized crime in the global fishing industry, and how can satellite technology assist governments to fight it? Well, uh, first of all, when, when we talk about fisheries crime, we, we, uh, we basically describe a whole range of different types of crimes committed through the whole fisheries value and supply chain. Uh, of course, illegal fishing is one of them. Uh, but there is also a whole range of other types of crimes, like economic crime, corruption, human trafficking, and, and also smuggling activities, as uh, uh, my colleague from Jamaica was, uh, was talking about, where small arms are being smuggled by, by fishing vessels, as an example. Um, I think what is important in this context is that a lot of emphasis is on the illegal fishing and the fishing activity itself. Um, what I think is important to remember is that what you are actually doing surveillance on mm -hmm. by, by, by gathering information about these types of activities is actually surveillance on economic activity. So it's, uh, it's basically a surveillance of, uh, of a company doing some economic activity for, to, to earn money. And that is where the, the, um, uh, the economic crime comes in, tax issues, etc. Satellite information can also be useful for customs and tax purposes. So, and I think that is important for, for the industry to, to sort of broaden your perspective. And of course, it's important to, to, to follow vessels, and particularly vessels that has gone dark, but it's also uh, important that this information that is being gathered can also be the pieces of information that can be crucial, for example, in an economic crime case, as an evidence that they actually have economic activity at sea. And the same with, uh, with human trafficking issues and so on. So I, I, I just wanted to say that to, to, to sort of broaden the, the mind, <laughs> uh, so to say. Um, but I, I think that, uh, of course, the main problem is that what we are seeing globally is that it's, it's, it's transnational organized crime. And it's in the name, it's organized, and it's transnational. So how do we as governments respond to that? Well, we have to try to be more adaptable. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, what organized criminals are experts um, is to, to reorganize. That's the way they, they, um, they work. And we as governments also have to have structures that makes us adaptable and that we can face these new challenges and changing modus operandi and so on. And that is um, the main reason why this is actually one of the, the main points of the political declaration for the Blue Justice Initiative, which is that there is a need for interagency cooperation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Baron Swatch, that is a tool for interagency cooperation, a digital tool for interagency cooperation that assists the Norwegian government in being adaptable, in to, to get the right information to the right time and so on. So if we transport that idea internationally that we have tried through this declaration and the Blue Justice Initiative, it is that the digital platform that has been developed for the Blue Justice Initiative, we'll call it the Blue Justice Community, mm -hmm. which is owned by you, <laughs> the Coastal Administration and Barents Watch, which is part of that. Um, it's owned by Norway, it's administrated by the United Nations Development Program. It's a secure platform for government-to-government -government cooperation uh, we are uh, in the process of implementing also tracking of vessels, particularly bringing in um, uh, information from the Norwegian government-owned uh, uh, satellites. Um, and, um, and 
in addition, we have also created uh, what we call the Blue Justice Tracking Center up in the north of Norway, as far north as, as you can go, in the city of Vardø. I, I believe it's, it's also a place where KSAT have some of the ground stations. So, and that's there we have basically created a hub with experts, analysts, that are serving the Norwegian government's need to, to analyze and to understand what is happening at sea, but also to, to serve um, states that are participating in the Blue Justice Initiative with understanding the information that they have. And what, is, what kind of information are we talking about? Well, mainly it's AIS collected by, by satellite. But of course, this can broaden based on, on what kind of information that we put into this system. So our approach has been create interagency cooperation, create a good network, create a digital platform to facilitate that interagency cooperation and give them the information that they need to do the job at home. And that is where you guys come in. With your ideas, new, new products, and so on. So um, I, I think I, I can talk more about the more specific problems a bit later, but I think this is, uh, this is the main challenges that we are facing uh, when it comes to, to transnational organized crime and the global fishing industry. Thank you. And that leads me to you, Nina, because Barents Watch, as you mentioned, has been a huge success for the past decade. Can you say something about success criteria? Why has it turned into such a success history? Uh, yes, um, uh, I think I would then uh, have three points, maybe four, three and a half. So when Barents Watch was established, there was, first of all, there was a strong political initiative, a strong political will of creating something that would be cross-sectoral and interagency. It had, uh, the second point, it had a strong mandate to be something outside or, or in addition to the traditional bureaucracy, because the bureaucracy is in its nature built to function uh, in this direction. Mm. So each department has its responsibility and its budget and the money go down and the reporting go up. And Barents Watch was established with a specific mandate of working across the sectors and across the bureaucratic uh, silos, so to speak. The third uh, factor, I think, was uh, that from the beginning, there was a decision that for Barnes Watch to be able to create this platform, remember when this political initiative started, nobody knew what was Barnes Watch going to be. There was a vision there, but nobody knew what it was going to be. But it was decided very early on that we need to have a strong focus on the end user and on the operative level. So more bottom up than top down, and uh, to put it uh, maybe in, in simple terms, you could say that there have been more fishing inspectors and more Coast Guard uh, officers and crews involved in creating Barnes Watch than the directors. The people who have been involved have been the ones who have a job that they need to do out there at sea. Mm. So the tool has been made and very, that's the fourth point, the three and a half uh, point, is the methodology that we used. We worked in an agile method, not in the old sort of waterfall method where you start a huge project and then five years later out comes something and then the world has changed in the meantime. Mm -hmm. No, in Barnes Watch we work with small steps, we go back to the end user, is this what you meant, is this what you need, is this useful? And then we get some small adjustments and we go back and we develop more. And this is the same way we now try to develop the, um, the Blue Justice community. And it's critical that we have voices like uh, Professor Gavin here, who tells us what is it that they need? What do they need to be able to meet and uh, solve the challenges that they have? Mm. And then when we speak to them and understand and listen to their needs, we can create tools uh, that hopefully will be as useful 
for the 60-something member states of Blue Justice as it has been for the Norwegian agencies. At least that's my ambition. Okay. So for me, it sounds like figure out the user needs and then build something to fulfill that. And you also mentioned that um, uh, earlier, Gunnar, that uh, you clearly have a good relationship and cooperation with all of the member states. So earlier today, the minister, Espen Bartaid, also gave us his insights on the NICFI model. So Marta, could you maybe tell us a bit more what you see as takeaways from that, the success NICFI? How can this be implemented into IUU fishing? Yes, I certainly can. I can save some time today because our minister told us very, in very good word the success of the NICVI program <coughs> and, and, and all about uh, what the program is uh, doing to, for the rainforest. But I think I can add that I think one important part of why it has been a success and has been recently evaluated by a third party to be a success is because it's been a very close collaboration between uh, the procurer, the ministry, and the service provider, which is KSAT Planet and Airbus, throughout the whole program. And the whole aim has been to get the information and the data out to the end users. <coughs> that has been key focus have a tool to get the data out to the, the, the key users. So the same model can be used also to establish a similar program, which we are thinking could be a headline, reduce uh, crime at sea or sustainable ocean monitoring. Uh, and this is something we are been discussing for uh, quite some time now. And in such a program, as we have spoke about today, we already have the tools available with Barentswatch. We have the platform, we have some information, but in order to be more useful, it needs more information into to, to this platform. And then it's, you know, to be straightforward, in order to be able to have such a program with more information to third party countries, we need a funded program like NICVI. Okay, thanks. I see we're kind of running out of time, so I will take one question from the audience. Uh, and I guess this is a question I could direct to you, Marta. Is there any statistics available on the efficiency of the use of space data to detect illegal fishing? I don't think that you might have like statistics, but <coughs> maybe you could say <coughs> something about the success rate and how we have been doing vessel detection by the use of satellites. Maybe I can do, uh, I don't know if, I, I don't think we have statistics for exactly that, but I can uh, make an example which is very related when it comes to oil spill monitoring, because another maritime service that uh, KSAT is providing, uh, also through, uh, to EMSA, to the European Maritime Safety Agency, is uh, oil spill detection. And uh, 15 years back, there was a lot of illegal discharges in, in, um, in, in the European seas. And there, there is many statistics which show that after satellite data was used in combination with aircraft monitoring and other means, the, re the illegal discharges was reduced significant with more than 50%. So it's more, you know, it's, it's more, it, it's both to have a tool to prevent uh, mm. activity and and also, uh, like Gunnar was saying, also to get there with high resolution data that we can also use it in, in a crime trial in the end. Excellent. You raised your hand. Yeah, I, I just wanted mm. to, to follow up on that because uh, I think the, the best example of, of how successful it is to use this type of information is, is what's happened in the Barents Sea. Mm. In, uh, in uh, around 2004, 2005, 2006, we had a massive problem with, uh, with unregulated fishing in international waters, uh, affecting the fish stocks in the Barents Sea dramatically, actually. And there was, uh, was, a, was a major problem in that area. But that was also approximately the time when the analysts in, uh, in the Fisheries Directorate and uh, the, the Coastal Administration and the Coast Guard actually started to work systematically using AIS data and other type of, of information. And uh, by doing that, they were able to predict uh, a lot of illegal activities, which gave the, the Coast Guard the possibility to go out and, and basically uh, did some really high-profile uh, arrests. 
with the result that uh, most of, uh, of the vessels that was engaged in this kind of um, illegal activities in this area left. And where did they go? Well, they went to Africa. So now they have the problem mm. that we had in the North Atlantic. That is the reality. So, uh, so yes, it's abs it's, in my mind, it's, it's, there's no doubt. <laughs> <laughs> you need this type of information to do it. But you also need government officials that know what they are doing and how to analyze the information and to use it and put it into practice. And that is very important because what we are dealing with here is, is law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that uh, the governments, that it's being developed for that purpose. Uh, it's also to be able to use that information in a, in a court of law, in the judicial system. So it's, it's the quality has to be of a good, it has to be good quality, so it actually flies through the system, so you can use it as evidence. That is very important. And it's also important, uh, before we close, I, I think it's important to say, it's also, especially now in, in the days when we have AI technology, new innovation solutions, etc. cetera, for, for what we are basically doing, we're not only tracking vessels, we're tracking people. Mm. And we also have to keep in mind the, the, the rights of these people. And particularly since we're in Norway and, in the, and also the, the European Union is, is, is not far away from, from here, uh, we have rules relating to, to dealing with personal and sensitive information. So, and that, that are the types of challenges that we as governments are concerned about. And that is, I think that is an important thing that you as an industry should take with you. So, uh, because that's about to, to, to build that trust between the, the industry and the government, which is the potential customer of these products. So, so um, I, I just wanted to, to mention that, um, but space technology is, is there. It has to be used and it should be used because it's very, very useful. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. And I think that as the numbers turn red on the screen here and saying we have, we're out of time, uh, I wish I would be, it could be, have some more questions, but I think we'll have to save them for later. But thanks to all of you for uh, taking part of this panel and for your insights on all the problems and challenges with IUU fishing and also some good ideas on how to take this further. Okay, thank you. <laughs>